All right, in this video, we are talking about a short essay, short and sweet and useful. The essay is called On Not Being a Philosopher, Epictetus and the Average Man. The author of the essay is Robert Wilson Lind, the Irish writer who lived from 1879 to 1949. In this video, I want to talk about what this essay is about, some of the key takeaways from the essay, and hopefully highlighting why this essay is still important, why it is useful for us to read and think with it. The essay is about, broadly speaking, the essay is about the place of philosophy in our lives. Does philosophy have a place in our lives, in your life, my life, imagining that we are not professional philosophers, that that's a separate category. Those are people who get paid to teach and write about philosophy. They are professional philosophers. They have a very practical relationship to the discipline of philosophy. We are not talking about them. We are talking about ordinary human beings like me, like you, presumably, not professional philosophers. Now asking, does philosophy have any application, any relevance to our everyday life, to the practical necessities and concerns of our everyday life? Lind completely agrees with the attraction of philosophy. So he's not one of those people who would dismiss philosophy out of hand because philosophy is not practical enough, it is not accessible enough, it is not written in, in easily understandable language, or one of those people who say philosophy has nothing to do with our everyday life. He's not saying those things. In fact, he begins with talking about the attractions and the excitement of philosophy. Philosophy is exciting because it promises wisdom. The promise of philosophy is to give us wisdom. So that's where he begins. That's how he begins. And then he gets to the problem very quickly. So let's read from the beginning of the essay. He says, I desire wisdom. I desire wisdom as eagerly as Solomon. But, here is the but, but it must be wisdom that can be obtained, can be obtained through reading, with very little effort, wisdom as it were, that can be caught or is caught by infection. He wants to catch the philosopher's wisdom as if it's a cold or a, a virus. He continues, I have no time or energy for the laborious quest of philosophy. I wish the philosophers to perform the laborious quest and at the end of it to feed me with the fruits of their labors. Just as I get eggs from the farmer, apples from the fruit grower, <laughs> medicines from the chemist, so do I expect the philosopher to provide me with the wisdom, with wisdom at the cost of a few shillings. So he doesn't want to go through the whole process. He just wants the best parts, the fruits, the end result. Is that possible? Can we treat philosophers as a kind of intellectual farmers who do the work and then give us the fruits, give us the, the final product, and we can just consume those products at the end? It might be this very thought could, could be offensive to some philosophers, but I think it is extremely important to raise this question. If the answer is no, why is it that philosophy cannot be treated like farm, like agriculture? What is the difference? Why can't we benefit from the fruits of philosophy, if you think that. Why can't we benefit from the fruits of philosophy without going for the ride, going for the whole process? Some people might say, no, you can. You can't you can easily just get the end result. Now, he, he argues, he, he points out very persuasively, I believe, that you cannot just get the fruits. You cannot just get the end result. So he demonstrates that by talking about his reading experience, reading Epictetus in particular. Even though he's specifically talking about Epictetus, I think what he is writing about is can be applied, can be extended to lots of other philosophers and texts. So he says that when he's reading Epictetus, he recognizes that this philosophy, this philosopher, this text wants to train his attention, wants to educate how he cares about things. He says, okay, I, I know Epictetus, I'm reading you. I know that you want me to care about some things and not care about other things. I, I, you want me to pay attention to certain things that are important 
and be indifferent to other things that are not important or I shouldn't pay attention to them in the, in the way that I originally pay attention to. I should be indifferent, for example, to the fact of my mortality, to pain, to poverty, and worldly concerns in general. And he says, in theory, I agree with the text when I'm reading it. But when I finish reading, I am still the same person. I am unable to continue to go on to care in a way that Epictetus wants me to care and be indifferent to things that Epictetus wants me to be indifferent to. He writes, quote, Close as is the resemblance between our opinions, I could not help feeling as I read that Epictetus was wise in holding his opinion and that I, though holding the same opinions, was far from wise. So two people might agree about the same things, the same they hold the same opinions, but one of them is wise about it, about the exact same opinions, but the other one is not wise. He continues, For indeed, though I held the same opinions for purposes of theory, I could not entertain them for a moment for purposes of conduct, action. Death, pain, and poverty are to me very real evils, except when I am in an armchair reading a book by a philosopher. If an earthquake happened while I was reading a book of philosophy, I should forget the book of philosophy and think only of the earthquake and how to avoid tumbling walls and chimneys, end quote. So he's talking about the difficulty of reconciling practical concerns, the practical matters of life and death on the one hand, and the armchair, apparently, the armchair concerns of philosophy. He also includes more mundane examples of at a restaurant, if he gives an order and the waiter gets the order wrong, he gets angry. And it is very difficult for him to keep in mind that the waiter is his brother. By nature, by virtue of being human, a human being, they are the same. That's what Epictetus says, where he says, I can't, I cannot let that guide my action. Similarly, when his hat is stolen, he cannot be consoled by philosophical ideas. Not only that, he says, even if my friend's hat is stolen, I cannot console my friend using philosophy. Even one degree removed, he cannot apply philosophy to somebody else who is close to him. So he's talking about, apparently, that there are these pressures coming from the world, from the world where he's living, where he has, he has to deal with matters of fact in this world. And those matters of fact are putting so much pressure on him, it seems like philosophy is impossible as a way of life. He writes, in a world in which things disappeared through loss, theft, and pinching, and in which bad meals are served by bad waiters in not very good restaurants, and a thousand other disagreeable things happen, an ordinary man might as well set out to climb the Himalayas in walking shoes as attempt to live the life of a philosopher at all hours. So, he is actually pointing out to something that we might forget. Many of us are interested in philosophy. We have, we think we have this, this genuine interest in philosophy. But we forget that it is extremely rare to go all the way with philosophy. And going all the way would be really strange, would be very unfamiliar, very, very distant from how we are living. We forget that going all the way with philosophy, living a philosophical life, embracing philosophical ideas in practice would, be, would look very different. He writes, most of us would be alarmed if one of our dearest friends began to put the philosophy of Epictetus into practice too literally. What we regard as wisdom in Epictetus, we should look on as insanity in an acquaintance. So, it would horrify us, even though we love, we seem to be loving philosophy on the surface, superficially. If it gets too close to us, if somebody that we know starts to live like Epictetus, live according to the dictums of Epictetus, we would be scared. We would be horrified because that would be too literal. So he is actually, he, in a very sneaky way, he's criticizing our professed love for philosophy. Many of us, many of us who have this theoretical engagement with philosophy who 
don't really get too close to it. We profess our love for philosophy, for wisdom from a distance on an armchair. Then he adds a note that is an extremely useful summary of this critique. He says that it is as though we enjoy wisdom as a spectacle, as something that is out there, has nothing to do with us practically. It is a spectacle, a delightful spectacle on a stage which would be unseemly for the audience to attempt to invade. So we say, okay, Socrates, Epictetus, Spinoza, they were philosophers and they are, we are treating them as spectacles on a stage. We can enjoy them as audience, but we cannot really join that stage. That's too, that would be too weird. That would be too strange. So this is, is this the interest we have in philosophy or can it be something else? Can it be something more? And I think that question is why, I mean, the, that is the point of this essay by Robert Lind, raising the question of, is this what philosophy is about? Is this all it can be for us? Is this the relationship that we can have or is there more? And if there is more, what is it? What is that thing that is more? All right, that's it for me. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any feedback. Information about my reading group, little Patreon community is in the description of the video and I'll speak with you in the future. Bye for now. Thank you.